Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Alhamdulillah, we have an uh, exciting new session. Uh, I'm excited to uh, introduce our uh, final speaker for this session, uh, who is going to talk about reactivating our purpose in this Ramadan and looking at the life of the Prophet Sallallahu and how we can transform our Ramadan into his Ramadan Sallallahu Sheikh Muhammad al Shinawi is a uh, graduate of Medina University. He studied the uh, College of Hadith. Uh, he currently resides as a, as a resident scholar in Brooklyn, New York, and he is a fellow and contributor to Yaqeen Institute. Uh, Jazakallah khair, Sheikh Muhammad al Shinawi. Jazakallah khair, Naki. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. We begin the name of Allah, all praise and glory be to Allah, and may His finest peace and blessings be upon His Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and His family and His companions and all those who tread His path. May Allah grant us and you a life upon His path and a death upon His religion, and allow us to be reunited uh, with Him as we rise from our graves in the hereafter. Allow us to drink from His hand at Al Kawthar. Allow us to be shaded by the reward of what we've memorized, what we've implemented, what we've recited of the Quran. May Allah Azza wa allow us to be among those who await for the doors of Jannah to open behind our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and those who stroll into those gardens and somehow know, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, exactly which palaces belong to them. May Allah allow us to recognize our good deeds and may Allah allow us to misplace and no longer have to face the consequence of our evil deeds. Allahumma Amin. So <clears throat> the, the topic that was asked of me, by the way, I'm not a graduate of Medina. Uh, I attended for a short period. I'm actually a graduate of Mishkeh University, Islamic University of North America, and I'm currently an instructor there by Allah's grace. Uh, and I say that so many of you, inshallah, can make use of the downtime, the lockdown, and, uh, and virtually uh, rise, uh, or rise in actuality uh, in your knowledge of these sacred sciences through these many online platforms, uh, through these virtual options that Allah has blessed our generation with. Okay. Uh, I was asked to talk about reactivating our purpose in Ramadan. You know, this is a topic that can never be addressed enough, especially in our times when the discussion on purpose is almost non-existent. You know, like, if you were to ask any Muslim, what is the purpose of life? They'll give you the proper answer that they know the Sheikh wants to hear. <laughs> uh, my purpose of life in life is to please Allah. My purpose in life is to get to Jannah. My purpose in life... Uh, is as Allah said in the Quran, many of them could even cite the verse, and I've not created the human to the jinn except to worship me. But but that reality <clears throat> has so many things working against it. It's like a light bulb that is, that is you know, so radiant, but so many layers of dust continue to smother it uh, by just our society being socialized, being socially conditioned. No, nothing is about hasanat and jannah points. It's all about like credit card points. That's what all the advertisements are about. That's what all the discussion is about. Uh, nothing is about why I'm here, the purpose of life. Because in, in you know the, the Western experience, the past few centuries, they've kind of grown very distrusting of religion. And the only religion they were familiar with, they, they lost hope in. And so they don't believe anything can give them the questions uh, to the big, the big issues, the existential issues, the, the, thing, the, the elements of their existence, the definition, the meaning of existence, the question of purpose, basically. And so they shifted gears. Their mindset went from, from God, pleasing God, and you know, living up to your purpose, because they couldn't identify where God was, clearly wasn't in this religion. This is their experience. And uh, clearly not this book is worthy of telling me what my purpose is. So they shifted from God and purpose to focusing on just themselves. They had, that's what they had their hands on. That's all they could really uh, engage with was their physical reality. Uh, and so they went from focusing on God to focusing on themselves. And they went from focusing on their purpose, the purpose of their lives, to focusing on the quality of life. And so we're so busy with the quality of our current life, the dunya life, that we're not really focused anymore at all because we are a product of our environment on, on the purpose of life. And that's really unfortunate. Because this is a side point, or maybe we'll have time to come back to it. The, you know, the purpose of your life is far more important than the quality of your life. Because the people that have the most options, money-wise, materialistically speaking, they are still the people that struggle the most emotionally and psychologically. Uh, whereas the people that may not be as well off in terms of just 
the material luxuries, but they have a sense of purpose in their life. Statistically speaking, they have better emotional experiences, better life satisfaction, better mental well-being, uh, all of that. Why? Because Allah created us like that. You know, when Allah tells you, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I didn't create the humans or the jinn except to worship me. Don't see that as just some plain directive. It's not just instructions. Allah is telling you about your nature. I created you with a purpose. I'm a, you're a purposeful creature. And then he tells you a very specific purpose, which is to serve him. But the point is you are purposeful. And so you need that more than you need the comforts and the luxuries. The comforts and the luxuries without a sense of purpose is going to make you feel like your life is not worth living. Uh, your life may be better off just taking. And so going from there <clears throat> to now what actually is the purpose so we can remove some of that dust, so we can allow the light bulb of what we're sure about to radiate into more aspects of our life. Because there's a big difference between like knowing factually what my purpose is and actually experiencing uh, a purposeful uh, lifetime. A huge difference. Um, that's why subhanAllah al-Hassan al-Basri, it comes to mind now, he used to say something uh, very profound. He says, if you ask people uh, about death, um, you'll get two different answers. If you ask uh, their, their mouth, they will give you one answer, but if you ask their actions, they'll give you another answer. He said literally, this is, these are his words, he said, I've never seen people more certain about something the way they're certain about death. Like, everybody agrees we're going to die, even atheists, right? We ag They agree. Uh, even those that are hopeful that somehow you're going to reverse the aging process one day with some advancement in science and technology. We all agree, as the mo we're all going to die. He says, but if you, a he says, people don't agree on anything. They're not certain about anything the way they're certain about death. He said, but the way they behave, they behave in a way that seems to express that death is so uncertain, so doubtful. You see, there's a big difference between someone living the experience of really recognizing it's radiant in their life, why I was sent to this earth, um, how unpredictable, unpredictable life is, why we're here. Because there's a big difference uh, between why we're here and what we do while we're here. Like, what is the primary purpose of us being here? and what we're allowed to do secondarily while we're here. Like if my if parents send a kid to a college campus, uh, you know, uh, dorming, away from them, and they're sending him for a very specific purpose, which is to get a college education, uh, and they're sacrificing a lot for that. Uh, is he allowed to read magazines while he's there on campus? Yeah, probably. Is he allowed to have lunch and dinner and sleep? Yeah, of course he is. But what if he spends his time eating, drinking, and magazining and doesn't go to college? No, that's not why you're here. <laughs> that can never happen at the expense of the purpose. You know, likewise, when Allah tells you, you weren't created for anything but to serve me, that means that is your purpose. If you don't do this, your life was an utter waste. That's like, you know, a car, for example. Can I use, can I purpose a car, use it to, to store extra clothing in there when my closet fills up? Yeah, you can do that. But that would be an utter waste of the car because the car was made for something far more valuable, significant than that. To spend $40,000 on a closet on wheels, this is just ridiculous. Likewise, no matter what we've done of college educations, of becoming geniuses, becoming uh, billionaires, becoming scholars, even in the religion, but we haven't served Allah primarily in our life, then our life was a waste. And we will realize that these accolades are in fact nothing to be proud of. They, we will find out that they were uh, a reason for our humiliation, may Allah forbid. Didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say that even Ibrahim alayhi salam uh, said, Don't humiliate me, O Allah, on the day that you pull people out of their graves. The day that all the riches, all the fortunes, and all biggest size family, all the descendants, will not benefit in any way except someone who comes to Allah uh, with a sound heart. And so serving Allah, getting a sound heart, recognizing Him subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the purpose of it all. Ramadan comes year in and re year out as this priceless treasure to allow us to restore that realization in practice. In practice. That is the power of Ramadan. You know, there's so many treasures in Ramadan, but uh, m my time is short. Uh, how does Ramadan help us do that? So our most primary needs as we see them, right? Food and drink. 
that is put on hold for a second, relatively speaking. Uh, some people, they think we fast for a whole month. I don't know if you ever had a colleague that thought you fasted for a whole month. They do. I said, no, no, no. <laughs> we, we don't fast for a whole month. We fast during the daytime in the month. They say, oh, man, I thought you guys were crazy. I've gotten that a lot, and I've heard people have had similar experiences. Uh, but they're like, but some of them will still be like, but still, though, um, why do you do that to yourself? Why do you starve yourself? We say, no, actually, we're not starving ourselves. In fact, if someone's sick or unable, they don't have to fast. They can make it up on shorter days or just pay like an atonement, a fidya for it. Uh, so a human being can go two, three weeks without food, by the way. Stuff I tell them. They say, no, no, still, you guys cannot be like this Ramadan thing. Why would you put yourself through that? Uh, and so they see it as just like self, uh, self, uh, what's self-harm. That's the term. They see it as just pure self-harm with no benefit whatsoever. We say, no, no, we do get a little bit hungry, but that's the whole point. There is a treasure in that moment when I deprive myself for a little bit. So many treasures. I can't list the benefits of Ramadan uh, here in this short talk. But one of the greatest benefits is restoring our sense of purpose. Uh, restoring who is number one, subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, we may not even realize it, but the most important aspect of Ramadan is the fast. It is the, that's why it's the mo only obligatory aspect of Ramadan. Like Taraweeh technically is not mandatory, right? Uh, but the most important part of Ramadan is the fasting because there's a treasure there. Allah obligates the most important things, the things we need most on our journey to arrive at Him safely. And so one of the treasures of Ramadan is for you to become more conscious of Allah, which is your purpose. Uh, the more you become conscious of him, the better you serve him. The better you serve him, the more conscious you become. It's just this virtuous cycle. But something like fasting does it in an amazing way. Because you may not realize it, but there are so many like split seconds in the first few days of Ramadan especially uh, that you say, I'm going to eat. Oh, no, wait, I'm fasting. It probably happens faster than you can notice. But that does something. It kind of like recalibrates you, reprograms you to your sense of purpose, like, oh yes, I'm the servant, he's the king. Allah said so, subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you just reflect on it, there's a really a treasure there. Restoring Allah, the centrality of Allah, the primacy of Allah and his pleasure over our pleasure in our life. We do that in practice. We reprogram ourselves to do that. Ramadan is great with that. Uh, and so even subhanAllah, you think about suhoor and Suhoor is harder uh, to explain because of the difference of opinion on, on how early before Fajr you need to stop eating. But let's just do Iftar. Iftar is an easier example because Iftar, according to all, all the scholars essentially, needs to happen on a dime. Like you should never delay Iftar. There should be no buffer between Adhan and your Iftar. Once you're certain that Adhan time has arrived, you're supposed to break your fast. Uh, but think about that. That glass of water, that date... It is perfectly halal. Uh, and then you're fasting, so it's absolutely haram. And then one minute later, that same cup of water, that same exact date becomes halal again. Like, what's the difference? Same cup of water. There's a big difference. The big difference is Allah permitted now. Allah didn't permit then. I am the servant. He is the master. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is what we were created to realize more and more. The more we do that, we have fulfilled our purpose which is what to please Allah and to be in his company forever in Jannah. And as we said in the beginning of the lecture, because I'm wrapping up now, it's an all or none. It's not like I'm going to sacrifice in this world so that I can get Jannah. No, we already saw that without this sense of purpose, without subhanAllah mechanisms like fasting, all of the teachings of Islam in reality, we're just focused on fasting because Ramadan is on the horizon. These all allow us to live a purposeful life here so that we enjoy it. Right, so that we, we feel fulfilled, our life is meaningful, but ultimately, so that our enjoyments never get interrupted. Like, imagine that imagine people that didn't have this sense of purpose present in their life actually lived good lives. I already told you in the beginning of the lecture, they don't, they don't, because it is agonizing to not have purpose, to not have meaning, to not have direction, to not have definitive guidance. But let's imagine they did. What is the point of enjoying yourself for a few moments on your way to destruction? Like, who would ever do that? a year or a hundred years in exchange for infinity. That's what a waste. That's nothing. Insignificant. Only an insane person would accept that exchange. But with our deen, you get both. You get here and there. It's an all or none. 
And the last thing I want to say also, so our purpose is to serve Allah, to get to spend time with Him forever, in eternity, in His company, to see His face, His pleasure, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And secondarily, because it is Allah's greatest gift for us, besides getting to see Him, besides His company, which is Jannah, Ramadan is great with that as well. And I'll share with you one hadith that reminds us that we should reflect on that concept uh, through our Ramadan. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, uh, The fasting person has two moments of, of joy that he gets to enjoy. He says, either, uh, That the fasting person has two joys that he gets to enjoy. When he breaks his fast, uh, he enjoys having broken his fast. The scholars say that could happen every night at Maghrib and it can also happen meaning after you fasted the whole month, you're joyous that you're celebrating Eid and you've accomplished the month, Allah has guided you uh, to, to fast it to the end of it. But the point is there's a joy to fasting here. Um, and then he says when you meet Allah, you get to enjoy not the breaking of the fast, but you get to enjoy the fast itself. You're so happy that you had fasted. And so notice the connection in this hadith between our fasting in this world and our ultimate destination uh, and our purpose and our objective there. And as some of the scholars said, um, be that person who uh, understands Ramadan for what it is and turns their life into Ramadan so that their hereafter may be Eid. Because it is a microcosm of your Islam. That is why it's one of the pillars of Islam that our Islam is built on. Zak Allah khayyan everyone. Wassalamu alaikum wa sallam wa barakatuh. Nabiya na Muhammad wa alaihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Sheikh Ammar, back to you. Assalamu alaikum wa sallam. Just as I incorrectly mentioned something about the background of our Sheikh uh, Muhammad al Shalawi, he has also incorrectly designated me as a Sheikh. So, <laughs> so we're we eye for an eye. But Zak Allah khayyan Sheikh Muhammad al Shalawi. Um, this was a very beautiful, bit uh, of beautiful reminder. Uh, and really touch the souls of uh, many of the people who are online looking at the comments that we have. Um, uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless our shayukh, to bless their families. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, bless this uh, this effort that we have and to bless all of us in this uh, in this quarantine. I would also like to make an appeal, uh, brothers and sisters. Um, uh, you know, you, you've heard this throughout the day. Uh, please go to icna.org slash donate. There's going to be some more information about the work that ICNA is doing. And as our, as our teachers mentioned, that this is a time where we can serve Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And while we're locked up in quarantine, it might, feel, it might seem like there's not much we can do to serve Allah. We can sit and we can talk with Allah. We can pray tahajjud, we can read Quran, we can make dua, we can fast. But we might still seem like there's not much we're doing for the world. At that point, it's an opportunity for us to take whatever resources Allah has given us and to share that with others. Uh, and that's the, the one of the works that ICNA is doing uh, across education, across relief, across charity, across da'wah, that we're spreading the message of Islam. So icna.org slash donate. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.